But dudes written, a product of my shrewd pinning. Confused in it, I'm saying I've chewed mics to a crew likes delusions, exuberant might. Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. So let's talk about WWE's earnings call. And uh, it was very interesting. It was very illuminating. There were some things about it that I really enjoyed. Because it, it opened my eyes to a couple of things. Which these things tend to do. So because I don't know what I, how I'm going to schedule the uploads. I will not be talking about the Vince McMahon AEW thing in this video. That's going to get its own video. So if you're only interested in what Vince McMahon said about AEW. There's probably another video either up or going to be up shortly. That is going to talk about that. This is going to be about the mundane business stuff about WWE. And even of that, I'm going to try to avoid most of the boring shit as far as the accounting and all that stuff is concerned. You know, look, nobody cares. Okay. Uh, revenue streams and all that type of stuff is seems to be fine. But other, whatever was down was due mostly to operating expenses, such as they were still running the Thunderdome for most of the second quarter. So that was part of the issue, but they have touted some very big successes that have taken place in the short amount of time that they have been running live shows. I should make a correction since they've been touring because, you know, Nick Khan says, well, all of our shows are live, but we haven't always been touring. It's a politician, man. Politicians do political things. All right, let's, let's start this whole sh shabazzle. So this thing, man, talked about focusing on live engagement, uh, live ticket sales, and that the advancements of SummerSlam are impressive. Uh, that the ratings for Raw and SmackDown and NXT have all risen in the wake of the return to crowds, and that they want to take advantage of that growth in different markets and stuff like that. He then kicked it over to Nick Khan, who gave some industry perspective. You know, Nick Khan's big thing is uh, the industry. What is the sports industry looking like? And how can they take advantage of what's going on in the sports industry? Uh, his thing was private equity firms are now starting to invest in live sports. He, he picked a very, very strange uh, <laughs> example of this. And that is a private equity firm that bought, a, I, think a, I think he said it was a 15% stake into an Indian cricket company or an Indian cricket league. I was like, what the hell does that have to do with pro wrestling in the United States? But <laughs> he's he basically saying like live sports and live um, attractions in general are being, are, people are still investing in them. And this is what WWE does. So, you know, again, sometimes, you know, he has a, a political way of, of spinning things. But he also says, like, you know, hey, all of these different leagues, the NBA, the NFL, all of them have saw their rights um, increase as far as their partnerships with uh, various platforms. And that's what we could be looking forward to in the WWE. Like, maybe not on that. I mean, he was soccer was asked about later or what they call international football, quote unquote. And he says, like, wow, WWE is not up on that on that uh, on that stage because soccer is the most uh, successful and the most popular sport in the world. It's just a good standard to look at and to engage, you know, what media companies are willing to pay for uh, popular uh, international sports, which he's, he considers WWE to be. So he continued um, talking specifically about the WWE in that, you know, there is growth in their international deals that they have uh, new deals in Australia and that the WWE is licensing long term in the network. Um, and now that the Peacock is going to be open to Europe and the UK. And uh, of course, everybody was cringing at this idea because people were like, no, I love the network. And now they're going to douse it with <laughs> Peacock. And so now we're all going to have shit pay-per-views now. Yeah. Welcome to the club, Europe. Um, but I don't. I don't think it's official yet, but they expect it to be. Um, so he then touted the success of Peacock and how, you know, the increased uh, spread of Peacock has led to some phenomenal increases in the viewership of their uh, pay-per-views, such as a 26% increase in backlash, WrestleMania backlash, which I'm pretty sure adding the title WrestleMania to WrestleMania backlash actually helped with that. Um, there was a 25% in the next event, 
but I forget what it's called. You know, it's right. <laughs> I don't want to waste my time sitting out here thinking about it. But it's a 25 percent increase in viewership there and a 46 percent increase in money in the bank. So 46 more people, 46 percent more people watched this money in the bank than watched last year's money in the bank. So all of this is compared to the year over year. Um, and I'm pretty sure money in the bank was definitely boosted by, um, not just being on Peacock, but also the return of live crowds. Now, a lot of this stuff that he was talking about, as far as the success of money in the bank was before John Cena showed up. Now it's, it's impossible for us to know that the, about the increase in money in the bank, like did more people watch it knowing John Cena was going to be there after John Cena showed up? Or was 46% more people watching it and then John Cena just happened to show up? We don't know. He didn't give any uh he didn't give any guidance or any ideas about that. But when he talked about the success of Money in the Bank in terms of the financial success, that it was the highest grossing uh non WrestleMania in this area, uh in I guess what was this, Fort Worth or whatever, whatever the hell that was. And that um that was, of course, those are tickets were sold before John Cena showed up. So nobody knew John Cena was going to be there, but the success, the success of the event was still massive as far as it being one of the biggest non-WrestleMania or the biggest non-WrestleMania, high, well, highest grossing, let's put it like that. Highest grossing non-WrestleMania in the area. But the, the, the SmackDown before that was the highest pay-per-view grossing, not highest non-pay-per-view gross in Houston. And that they had a 50% increase in merchandise sales since the last time they were in Houston. So this is a recurring theme that they're going that, you know, he's going to talk about. Essentially, they're going to talk about the city uh, and how it broke previous records and how it, you know, grossed uh, more than the last, not only the last time that they was there, but actually broke more records than the last time they were there and increased uh, merchandise. So uh, Monday, the 19th, they were in Dallas. It was the highest paid ticket sales that they have ever had for a non-pay-per-view in Dallas. And the merchandise was up 50%. Cleveland, highest non-pay-per-view that they've ever done in that area, a 60% increase in merchandise sales. The Rolling Loud uh, event, they said they did two matches there. They performed in front of 75,000 people and they, they had strong merchandise sales there. He didn't give any specifics. As far as, you know, exact numbers. But, you know, I didn't even know that they were selling merchandise at Rolling Loud. But now that I do know that, I'm not surprised. And, you know, I guess it depends on what kind of gear they were selling. I'm pretty sure it wasn't John Cena t-shirts. So they, he started talking about the non-television uh, televised events and how well those are doing. Like he sold 95% of the Pittsburgh arena and did a plus 25% over the last time they were there in merchandise. Louisville, a 25% increase in merchandise sales there. In Kansas City, they had their highest grossing non-pay-per-view event in Kansas City. It had a 50% increase in their merchandise sales. And he says that, you know, merchandise sales increase is partly um, due to the ability to now to purchase uh, gear on the app. I'm not so sure what that is, but I do know that there will be also another store opening on YouTube. They will start some type of home shopping network kind of show where they're going to have like gear and you can order it live. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty wild. I, I want to see it only because I, I just want to see it. I have no intentions of buying anything, but, uh, I think this was before, this is definitely before they even opened that thing. Uh, he also touted the success of SummerSlam, and that is going to be the highest grossing SummerSlam of all time. They sold 40,000 of the 45,000 seats before even announcing a main event. And um, he also talked about why uh, they will be having pay-per-views on Saturdays. So he says that now that the NFL is going to be changing their season, there's going to leave openings for big Saturdays um, and Saturday is looking like an opportunity and they're going to try it with SummerSlam. And then they planned another one with the new year's day show that they want to do. And they're basically move shuffling things around a little bit in accordance to what the NFL is doing. So they're trying to avoid the NFL and the NFL has extended their season. And, you know, I guess I think there's also an extended playoff. I know it's an 18 game season now. 
Um, so maybe he's trying to just avoid the NFL and see if they can increase their viewership of their pay-per-views by not having them on Sunday nights at the same time that the, as NFL is on. So if that's going to be the case, what about like Survivor Series and the Royal Rumble? You know, and maybe those are stronger events, but what about smaller events like TLC and Clash of Champions? I'm pretty sure the football season is going to be going on and maybe you're trying to avoid competing with uh, Sunday Night Football. Uh, which it could be the case. But it's something to think about. Also, college football is pretty is pretty big. But I think if you're looking at it in terms of international, which I'm pretty sure they are, there is no college football in like the UK or anything like that. You know, I don't know what Saturday night sports would be in Europe or somewhere else. Somebody from from Europe, let me know, or somebody from India or something like that, let me know what uh, Saturday what's, what are like big Saturday night sports. Um, but I know in the United States, usually it's Saturday afternoons and Saturday nights are big college football in, in most places. And maybe they feel they could have a better chance of beating college football or at least getting that initial viewership. But I've never seen them have this problem before or care about this before. So this sounds like it might be a Nick Kind thing because Vince has always run Sundays knowing that the football is on and did not give a shit. So them or maybe it's just, you know. I think where they're just going to dip their toe into Saturdays because it's almost always bad to do a Saturday night show because you expecting your fans to go out and be sociable on Saturday nights that people are going to go out on dates and stuff like that. Or, you know, that's a big date night. You would expect that to be the case and for, you know, not to have events on Saturdays. But maybe maybe they say, hey, you know, it's, it's worth a shot. Very weird. It's very weird. That's that's one of the weirder things that I walked away from is, you know, this new interest in throwing events on Saturdays. And now other companies have done it. You know, AEW usually does events on Saturdays. Um, Ring of Honor, uh, Impact, all of them are sort of moving to Saturdays instead of, you know, but Impact tends to jump back and forth. And hell, even Ring of Honor, they do things on Friday nights. So and that's notoriously not really a good night for uh, pay-per-views and wrestling in general is Friday nights. But all right, so let's move on. Um, he t- touted the success of the TikTok announcement where, where they said that you, they're having this game where you could be an announcer for SummerSlam and that this thing has had 9 million viewers and, you know, it has it has all this engagement and they're really proud of that, really happy about that TikTok thing. They're doing John Cena NFTs. So they did the Undertaker NFTs. Those sound like gangbusters. Now they're going to do John Cena next. And he also talked about the Blumhouse TV series, the United States of America versus Vince McMahon, and the plans for that in the future. So Stephanie came up next, and I always find Stephanie's uh, piece of of the presentation to be the, the most illuminating. Because she deals with brand management and she also deals with like brand, um, how, how the brand is, a, appears in the media, right? So one thing that she talked about, I'll, I'll, I'll get into some of the other stuff, but she, the one thing that people walked away from that I saw a lot of people tweeting about and there was a lot of engagement about was her touting the success of the Army of the Dead movie, WWE crossover stuff from WrestleMania Backlash when they did the, the zombies, um, Stephanie talked about it almost glowingly, right? She talked about how, you know, there was 500 million impressions, which she said half a billion, but of course that's 500 million, um, that there was 25 million content views of this zombie thing and that they, they managed to capture three of the 14 trending tabs with their zombie stuff. And that it increased the cultural impact of WWE and it increased uh, the value of the Netflix movie and it helped make one, make army of the dead, one of the more successful Netflix films. And you notice that she didn't talk about whether it was good or bad or whether that announcement was good or bad or whether the people talking about it was good or bad. She didn't give a shit and WWE does not give a fuck. And this is what I, I talked before about wrestling becoming generic content. This is the type of stuff that I'm talking about. All they cared about was eyeballs on screens. They didn't give a shit whether you, most of the people who saw that zombie shit were probably angry and probably said it was stupid. 
and, th and thought it was laughable. They understood it was a long commercial. They understood that. But they thought it was stupid to dump that shit into a wrestling show. And they did it anyway. And then they talked about, oh, look at how successful it was. Because they don't give a shit. They don't give a fuck. You clicked on it. You watched it. Thanks. Now we can go to the earnings call and say, hey, look what we did. Look at the success of our crossover match with zombies. Come on, bro. This is why you should listen to the conference calls. <laughs> Not to hear Vince diss AEW. But for shit like this, because it actually explains why they do stupid stuff. They do stupid stuff for financial reasons. And everybody knew that. But it worked. It's outrage marketing. You make people angry. And this is why, you know, I, I probably gonna do it. I, I, I thought about doing a separate video on this. But the He-Man, Kevin Smith stuff, where people get really mad and they start doing videos about how uh, Kevin Smith is, he lied to the fans and and all that stuff. All that shit is just outrage marketing. It's become the rage of the last couple of years. People being negative, people being angry about it, doesn't really change what they do. They just look and see what the engagement is. And uh, apathy is the only way to change their minds on these issues. Like, they'll stop doing this stuff if people stop reacting to it, people stop caring about it. Um, but just why they, they, they kind of do it in such an outrageous fashion. Like they did an entire match. It's not one thing that they did a commercial or they did a segment and it was stupid and was throw away. They did an entire match. It was like a five to six minute commercial just for army of the dead. It had nothing to do with <laughs> pro wrestling, you know, destructive, very destructive. And most people probably forgot it even happened by now. Um, in any event, here's what else she talked about. Um, she says that SmackDown's ratings have gone up 21% year over year and 42% in the 18 to 49% demo. Those are both increases year over year, of course, includes the new, they now have crowds. So I'm pretty sure that helped year over year. I believe second quarter 2020, there was no Roman Reigns. So um, that was for SmackDown. Uh, Raw on July the 18th had an 8% year over year increase and a 15% increase in the 18 to 49% demo. Again, not, no, they're not talking about the quality of the show, about only whether people are tuning in or not and what kinds of people are tuning in. Uh, she touted the summer of Cena, the big storyline that they're going to have, you know, Cena wrestling this summer. And, um, she says that TV viewership has stabilized with modest increases in raw. And that has been a 22% increase in raw ratings since in the 18 to 49% demo since raw returned to crowds and a 20% increase for SmackDown since the return of crowds, a 5% increase in digital video views. They now produce, or they have now been viewed 394 million hours of pro programming. That, that was kind of hard to 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 parse out because 394 million, I'm not sure what that means. But I know it's also, and later in the thing, she says that, you know, Facebook is their primary way of people sharing their content. So, and she said it's new and old content. So it makes sense that, uh, like when I use Shareably or Tubular Labs or something like that, and people think that I'm just, you know, oh, it doesn't mean anything. Like you see people say that all the time. They talk about this stuff on the conference call because it matters that people are watching the product in any way that they watch the product. So this uh, was is the big picture is that they have a 5% increase in their digital views and that they've had a 13% increase in uh, video digital views as well. And they now have been viewed 11.2 billion times. So an, another big thing for me to walk away from, uh, from the Stephanie's portion, which is really, I usually listen, only listen to Nick Kahn and Stephanie. I really don't listen to Kristen that often. But they touted the success of the biographies on A&E and the Most Valued Treasures. So here's the success of Most Valued Treasures or Most Wanted Treasures and biographies. They increased A&E's total viewership on their network, 21%. And that's just for, you know, for Sunday. So 
what they're doing is they're comparing what A and E had at, on Sundays before to WWE's programming, their additions. So whatever A and E would have had on Sundays before, they're now saying the WWE was able to increase their viewership twenty one percent. But here's the killer: they increased the eighteen to forty nine demo ninety percent, a ninety percent increase in the eighteen to forty nine demo for a and e that is a phenomenal increase that is phenomenal so that means you're probably going to see more of this stuff they're probably going to do more biographies more most wanted treasures and it also talks about the strength of their ability to monetize old talents because all of that stuff was about talent that either dead or retired you know not in, not anything about their current talent and i saw a lot of people who were talking about Oh yes, these the ratings for these things were kept going down because you know Booker T and all this kind of stuff wasn't, wasn't really all that hot, and uh, most wanted treasures came on I believe at ten o'clock, so it was kind of like eh, you know these are modest successes. It's like no, these things are phenomenal successes in the eighteen to forty nine demo. <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal it's successes. So you could probably guess that they're more than likely going to be doing more of this. But this is the kind of stuff that they can take when they want to do the TV show, United States of America versus Vince McMahon. They could take it to TV networks and say, look at what we, what we can do. And the zombie stuff is the same way. They'll say, hey, look at what we was able to do by partnering up with Netflix. We was able to in, uh, engage with our audience and it enraged them and pissed them off. But this is how many people was able to share it and talk about your product or that or Netflix's product. And increased it. And of course, it just happened to star a de former WWE superstar, right? Dave Batista, right? And then they can go and say, well, you maybe you don't think that we're all that great. And it says, look at what we was able to do for A&E. We're our most wanted treasures and our biographies. 90% increase in the demo. 21% increase total viewership. And of course, I don't even think they've done uh, Total Divas or anything like that in a while. So I'm pretty sure like that's for A and E. So that's a com another completely different uh, program, and that's why they do this stuff, man. And that's why we should be paying more attention to what the the business end of it. You know, the business end is very important. So let's go through some of the questions. They went through a question and answer period. I, I skipped Kristen completely. She probably talked about something important there, but I, maybe maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um. I was I was like, okay, this is going on a little long. So they were asked about the TV rights deal. There's supposed to be some new TV rights deals that they were working on. And uh, Vince and Nick Khan said they both were still working on it. So they talked about the out-of-ring TV production. You know, the these different programs that they're doing. You know, Most Wanted Treasures, Total Divas, all this sort of, all this sort of stuff. Is it for profit or is it promotional? Are you just trying to get the brand out there? Or are you really trying to monetize, create new revenue streams with this thing? And Nick Khan said yes to both. That scripted and unscripted is both profit and promotional. And that they what they want to do is extend the brand. They want to extend brand and talk and you know deepen that brand penetration into the market. And uh, Kristen or Krista, uh, Christina, I don't I don't know what the fuck her name is. She's the CFO of WWE for people who don't know, but she says that they want to avoid the financial risks of TV studios and movie studios. And what I'm guessing that means is unions that they want to avoid uh, the high cost of non-scripted television programs. Because, you know, a lot of these, pretty much all of them, as far as TV is concerned, is unionized. Um, I was a part of a TV show once. Uh, it was for BT. And the it was a silly show about people cleaning up their neighborhoods and stuff like that. And it was unionized. And and so that meant that, you know, <laughs> there were people who got like boxes of pizza for lunch and the unionized cameramen and stuff like that were getting like catered lunch because it's in their contract that he cannot be fed pizza. It's ridiculous okay it's absolutely ridiculous but it increased the cost of production so that's one of the risks that you would try to avoid 
when it comes to uh, producing uh, television. And that's one of the things that, you know, I'm pretty sure that they're interested in. They were asked about sponsorships on two different occasions. For instance, they were uh, on one question. They were asked about what are some new and increased opportunities and sponsorships? And another question they were asked is, uh, when can we expect more growth in your sponsorships? And Stephanie answered both of these questions. She talked about it was tough to give projections, but there is clearly an upside now that they can fully engage with Peacock and that their content production is becoming a little bit more popular and that they have increased their sponsorships 43% and increased fan engagement. So they don't, she really kind of answered that question. Like she didn't understand why the guy would even ask that question, <laughs> but she was pretty, pretty nice in how to answer it. All right. So just to, just to touch on this issue, uh, Vince of course was asked about AEW and he said he doesn't believe that your competition. Nick Khan then said that, you know, he views it like a horse race, like there are horses wearing blinders and that they are focused straight ahead on what they're doing and not what other people are doing. And that he used the old Netflix line about everything is competition, even sleep. And there, he's not wrong about that because any, any hour that you're not watching WWE, that's an hour that they're losing money. And that's, that's a, that's a weird way to think about it, but they have a 24 hour network. So if you're not watching the network, cause you're you know listening to some dweeb on YouTube, that's taken away from them. And sure, that's true. But of course, it, then he was asked the question about, hey, you guys want to you know, compare yourselves to the NFL and the NBA and soccer and all this type of stuff. You got, do you guys even produce enough content to, to uh, compete with them? And, and Nick Khan, to this point, responded like, bro. <laughs> well, he didn't say bro, but he was kind of like, bro, we produce seven hours of wrestling a week, 52 weeks a year, plus pay-per-views, plus the outside the ring stuff that we do. Like, I think we're good on, <laughs> on content production and we're always trying to produce more content. And of course they didn't take into account the commercials and stuff, which featured WWE superstars because they can't talk about every little thing, which is probably why they also don't talk about YouTube. Um, you can't talk about everything. It's just too much. And these things are meant to be like two hours or something like that. So it's a very interesting question here. Sleep is the competition, which of course it is. And they produce all of this content because this is what the network partners require of them and they're going to require more of it. So therefore they're going to produce more. And WWE becoming generic content is heartbreaking because it means that they really don't care about the quality of it anymore. But it's good for business because now they don't have to worry about producing good content anymore. <laughs> they can just produce shit and it's not good. You know, now I'm not saying that the stuff that they haven't been producing is good. Raw is terrible. Of course, SmackDown is mostly good. Most wanted treasures was fun. Uh, the biographies were fun. You know, I'm pretty sure the Vince McMahon TV show is going to be excellent. Even if it's going to be a, a load of horse shit, it's still going to be fun and funny, but that's really, um, the, the content production end of it is they want to produce good content, obviously, but they also don't care if it's shit, you know, so <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, the last question I'm going to go over is Nick Khan was asked about combat sports and there were, there, have, there are new companies that are coming into the combat sports space. And he's asked, he was asked if, uh, if he expects to see some type of consolidation in combat sports, as far as companies buying out other companies. And Nick Khan actually said he wants to see the opposite. He wants to see more combat sports because he says that it's good for business. But he says that the global territory that this man created with pro wrestling, with having one national territory, has seemed to work out for both WWE and UFC. And he says that the UFC has kind of copied that and created a governing body that kind of encompasses all of MMA. But it's always good to see three or four different MMA companies. And the interesting thing about this MMA thing is, yes, there are more MMA companies now. You have, I think, I believe TNT has their own MMA company. Of course, Bellator exists. Um, what is Invicta FC? What is that? Is that TNT's thing or is that uh, Axis thing? I forget which one it was. 
But each one of them now pretty much have their own MMA leagues. And I talked about this previously with the USFL, the United States Football League, where you had uh, Fox, I believe it was, that went out and purchased USFL's uh, assets. And, and it's going to create a new football league. And Vince, you know, he, he he's going to miss out on this big payday. But the XFL still exists out there, too. And so what you're probably going to have is people starting up their own MMA leagues, people starting up their own football leagues. And yes, like I said before, people are going to start up their own pro wrestling leagues. It's, it is bound to happen. It's bound to happen. It, it, it might just be that people buy out the companies that already exist. But, you know, he says he wants to see the opposite as far as, you know, uh, more. And I think he will end up getting more. You know, because there's MMA is pretty popular. Um, and you have, I think one of these promotions out here that these MMA promotions this is all female promotion. I think it's the one that, uh, that Sinclair, is it Sin, not Sinclair, uh, Anthem, the ones who own Impact. I think they own an all women's MMA promotion. You know, I believe I saw that. I, I don't know. I don't know MMA that well, but I'm pretty sure they're, they're, that's what they're going for. So it's a very interesting game that they're playing here. And they ask Nick Khan these very detailed questions and Stephanie too. So it's a very, it was very positive, very interesting. Um, there's probably some bits and pieces that I'm missing that I thought were very interesting, but I was literally doing other things while I was taking notes. I was also making dinner. So, so, <laughs> so uh, let me know what you guys think about all this stuff um, in the comment section below. Like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel. If you want to sponsor the net, this, this channel, go to the link tree in the, in the description and go to subscribe star. And then you can click the subscribe star. It's $5 a month. You can help your boy out. Or if you just want to throw some quick cash in my direction, because you like what I do, the cash app should be in the, uh, in the comment section, click that and send me whatever you want. $2, $3 lunch on you. You know, a cup of coffee on you, whatever. And um, I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out. The skin tone, so why attach yourself and piggy back the wealth you didn't earn or lack yourself? I'm telling you to own up to your own success and failures. It's a reason why these.